Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending where in the world you are joining us from. I'm Alice Roberts, Professor of Public Engagement in Science at the University of Birmingham in the UK, and I'm delighted to be introducing and chairing this launch event for Children in All Policies 2030. On behalf of CAP 2030, a warm welcome to all of our panellists. We have a fantastic range of experts today with diverse experience and expertise, and I'll be introducing each of them as we go along. Greetings then to our audience from all over the world, wherever you're joining us from. We know that there are some of you joining us from New Zealand, South Africa, Bangladesh, Sweden, Australia, China, Russia, Greece, and many more countries. We are delighted to have you with us. And we're all here because we see children's health and well-being as being vitally important as we meet and adapt to the major challenges of the 21st century. In February last year, the WHO UNICEF Lancet Commission published its report, A Future for the World's Children. That report identified climate and commercial threats to children's health and well-being and argued that children should be placed at the centre of policies for sustainable development. CAP 2030 then is a response to those recommendations, a brand new organisation aiming to put children in all policies in order to, to achieve sustainable development, which provides every child with a healthy future. Tomorrow is Earth Day, and it's also the start of a Leaders Summit for Climate. We can hope that 2021 will prove to be a turning point when governments really commit to decisive action against climate change. Children are naturally very concerned about climate change and their futures. And of course, we've seen many of them speaking out and demanding action. In this launch event then, we are focusing on climate change and children's health and wellbeing. And over the next hour and a half, we'll have the opportunity to hear from all of our panelists. I'll be asking them questions which have been sent in to us already from other experts and members of the public but if you're watching this live, you can also tweet your questions to us and they might get picked to be asked to our panellists. So please do engage via social media. Through what I'm sure will be a lively discussion, we'll hear more about the mission and focus of CAP 2030, as well as hearing about some of the specific CAP 2030 projects that are already starting around the world. And we'll also be premiering a documentary film on new threats to children's health as identified by that WHO UNICEF Lancet Commission. After the film, then, we'll move to looking at potential solutions. That's what we're really interested in and motivated by. But in this first Q&A segment, we'll be focusing on the challenge, the threats posed by climate change, the reason why we've all assembled here this morning. As the world continues to struggle with COVID-19, a child health crisis is simmering away in the background, mostly hidden away from media attention. And this crisis has largely been made worse by the pandemic. Precious progress on children's health is stalling and quite possibly in some areas even reversing. And new threats are emerging. We often see children and young people protecting the, protesting the lack of action on climate change for good reason. Children are already suffering from the climate crisis and they are bearing around 90% of the burden of disease from it, estimated uh, by some studies. So my first question then that I'm going to direct to the panel is about how the climate crisis is affecting children around the world how it's affecting them now and what we expect to see in the future. And I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Anthony Costello, who is Professor of Global Health and Sustainable Development at University College London. Anthony, what exactly are the effects of climate change on children? Well, thank you very much, Alice. I mean, it's happening now, as you say, all over the world. And there's growing concern about the impacts of heat stress from the extreme heat waves we're seeing increasingly in many countries on mothers and infants. Uh, in Bangladesh, many families in the southern districts are drinking more salty water 
which is worrying for effects on pregnancy and babies. Uh, in Nepal, the country I know well, it, it, right now they have wildfires in 73 out of 77 districts. And the effects of that are, uh, that's the worst they've been on record. And um, a particular air pollution in Kathmandu is now 15 times what it should be above the WHO safe level. Uh, if you look at droughts, droughts and malnutrition across the Horn of Africa are increasing. Poor harvest, recurrent insecurity, that leads to food uh, insecurity and, and falling food reserves. And in Somalia, we're now currently in malnutrition levels up to six times what the UN considers an emergency. But droughts are all over the world, Afghanistan, China, Iran, Pakistan, but also southern United States, southern Europe, and they have knock-on effects. So in, in Africa, for example, there are locust swarms, uh, not only in East Africa and the Horn of Africa, but also uh, at the moment, a, an increased swarm risk in uh, Southeast Angola, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia. And then a new scientific report suggests that India's monsoon or the whole of South Asia's monsoon is becoming more intense and more chaotic. And that has consequences for future farming and food security. And we still have 60 million more malnourished people today than we had in 2014. 700 million people go to bed hungry each night. Four million children under five have severe acute malnutrition and only about a quarter of them get access to treatment. And then with infections, and I won't go on about this, but the spread of mosquitoes, particularly the EDs in Latin America, is causing more and more outbreaks of dengue and uh, chikungunya, Zika virus, yellow fever. And what, I'll give you one quote um, from a recent report in The Lancet about in India, where although survival is improving, malnutrition rates have actually gone up in several states recently. And there was one quote from a senior official there who said a lack of coordination between ministries and departments that work on nutrition is a major factor. And that's why we're calling this children in all policies 2030, because many countries have this problem. I think all governments and maybe Helen will talk about that later. And investing in children is a government's prime responsibility. That's what we want to get across. And we've set 2030, not just because it's a nice target, but because by that date, we will have exceeded our carbon pollution budget and we will rise above 1.5 degrees. And the scientists say that risks all kinds of tipping points, methane release from the permafrost and all of this. So the message is our children are suffering today, but we're creating an environmental future for our children that is unstable, is fragile, could cause mass migration and potential catastrophe in future. This decade is critical. We have to act. <clears throat> We've known about climate change for some time. Why do you think that there's been a, a lack of action on it then? If, we, if we're already seeing the impact of it and already seeing the impact on our children's health, Anthony? Yeah, I mean, we've known it about it for 40 years. Uh, I mean, interestingly, Margaret Thatcher, because uh, she had a degree in chemistry, actually got this. I mean, I'm not a fan of her other policies, but she did understand about the risk of climate change. Um, of course, it's a massive transition. The whole of our modern economy has rested on fossil fuels and politicians have shorter term time frames to respond to their electorates and therefore they kick it down the road and and that's what we've been doing for the last 20 years and it, every year we delay the price goes up and the potential impacts are greater and i think this is a massive political challenge and we do now have a president of the united states who is really talking this up big time we have commitments from china from many countries around the world that they are going to take action but too often it's putting it down to 2050, you know, when we've got to act now and we've got to be dramatic about it. And we do have solutions. I mean, renewables are expanding hugely and can provide clean energy for people around the world, but we're not doing it at anything like the pace we should be doing. Thank you very much, Anthony, for giving us some insight into the, the range of impacts and threats 
that are facing the world's children in the coming decades. Uh, the next question is about how we can possibly categorize and quantify the nature of the threat. Uh, what evidence do, do we have on that? It seems extremely complex and complicated. So I think this is a question for Dr. Marina Romanello. She's the data scientist at the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change. Marina, are we able to rank the top threats to children's health from climate change? Thanks, Alice. That's a really good question, a really important one. And I think the answer is, well, only partially. We have very good understanding of how the climate is changing as a result of human activity. We have a very good understanding of what that means for hazards, and we can model some of those hazards and the impacts. For example, at the Lancet Countdown, we do some modeling of that, and we have indicators that capture how the changing climate and the heating climate is starting to affect our crop capacity, our crop productivity, how um, the environmental niches for infectious disease transmission is changing, putting particularly children at risk from vibrio infections uh, and other infectious diseases like those transmitted by mosquitoes. So we can capture that and that we can rank. We can rank individual risks and threats. But perhaps what is more important is to understand that all of these risks will add on to each other and they don't act individually. So when we start compounding what it means when you have a drought event overlaid with a reduced labor capacity because it's just too hot to work outdoors. And on top of that, you have an infectious disease that is uh, driving malnourishment as well into, to children and how that all starts interacting with our social matrix and the social as well as physical determinants of health. And that is what we really, really need to be capturing. Um, being able to understand the full scope of the climate change risks on, on health is fundamental and we're still struggling to understand its full dimension. This is particularly true for the case of children. Many studies focus on adults, focus on adult populations and children are at incredibly vulnerable position because they're growing and because any impacts on their current health will be irreversible and will really determine their health moving forward into the future, both through their physical interactions as well as the social matrix, uh, whether they're living in a household that can afford food, uh, they receive adequate education, they're exposed to uh, extreme weather events that also impact on their mental health. That can have an enormous uh, in impact on their futures as well. So that is one of the biggest issues at the moment and why we really are calling for children in all policies to be sure that we are starting to capture that full dimension of threats onto children's health and that both science and policy start addressing and compounding these multi-hazards to be able to rank and address them uh, in a way that is uh, measurable towards their, their real threats and impacts. Thank you very much, Marina. And I'm very happy to see that we've got some questions coming in. So we'll take some of those questions from our live audience shortly. But I want to move on now to a question about one of those particular impacts of, uh, of changing climate in relation to a particular group of diseases. And these are vector-borne diseases, the sorts of diseases that are carried by mosquitoes, ticks, sandflies. And there are many signs that uh, these vector-borne diseases, ranging from malaria and dengue fever to leishmaniasis and Lyme disease, may increase due to both global warming and habitat encroachment. And actually, as Anthony has already explained, we're, we're already seeing that happening. Uh, malaria is still one of the most deadly threats for young children worldwide. So how is climate change expected to affect the in incidence and geography of malaria and other vector-borne diseases in Africa? We have with us Joy Pumapi, who is Executive Secretary of the African Leaders Malaria Alliance and former Minister of Health for Botswana. Joy, what is the scale of the problem then and, and how are you preparing for it? Thank you so much, Alice, uh, and uh, an absolute pleasure to be here uh, to, to hopefully, um, you know, increase the focus on this important area, particularly the impact it is having on children. Climate is indeed beginning to affect the incidence and the geography of, of malaria and other vector-borne diseases on the African continent. Um, 
In 2019, the global tally of malaria cases was 229 million, with Africa shouldering more than, you know, close to 92% of the disease burden. The disease claimed more than 409,000 uh, lives uh, compared to 419 in 2018. So you can see that there is really isn't any improvement, but over 90% of these uh, lives that were lost were children under the age of five years. And however, what is becoming increasingly evident is that the, the vector control uh, uh, and the aggressiveness of, uh, of uh, the implementation of the interventions has not actually reduced in the last two, three, four, five years. But it is suspected that the climate-linked uh, changes are the ones that are contributing to this increased uh, disease burden and the fa our failure to actually reduce it. I'll give you an interesting example. Since 2014, uh, following precipitation increases and rises in temperature in East Africa of up to two degrees uh, Celsius, uh, outbreaks of uh, malaria and, and other viruses such as dengue, Rift Valley fever, Zika viruses, yellow fever have, be, have been increasing at an unprecedented rate. Unfortunately, we are not adequately prepared for diseases like dengue, uh, chikungunya, and, and even though they, they, they are becoming increasingly more widespread. And what is actually becoming a, even more a worrying is that extreme weather events that cause flooding have intensified the transmission of malaria and Rift Valley fever. For example, a malaria epidemic has spread from three districts a, in Western Kenya uh, before the, the, the increases of two degrees in temperature, before the uh, increase in precipitation from third, three districts to 13 districts in Western Kenya. And these outbreaks have now become annual events with serious impacts on the learning outcomes of children. And of course, morbidity for under fives and, and, uh, and uh, anemia for pregnant mothers, which has, as you know, has an impact again on the, on the development of the child. Even adaptation strategies to climate change that some countries are adopting, you know, such as irrigation, have now increased the risk of malaria. Rwanda has now had to employ drones to spray fields that are being irrigated because these are now breeding sites for mosquitoes. So, and you know, the, 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 the climate change related impact is, is massive. There's the destruction of forests. The as we should know increases local temp temperatures by three to four percent, and therefore increases breeding sites for malaria. But even in those uh, uh, parts of the continent where uh, temperatures are already high, you know, there are almost desert conditions. Uh, the increases in in temperature are also an ideal breeding site perhaps not for malaria, but for dengue, for chikungunya, and other aboviruses. And to date, very few of our member countries have got comprehensive integrated vector control management strategies that can be able to control this, the, the, these new pandemics. And that, as we have already said, are failing to control malaria. So that is the challenge that is facing the African continent. And it is one of the reasons why we're advocating not just for climate uh, uh, mitigation strategies, but also for the elimination of these diseases because they are only going to increase with climate change. Joy, at the moment, how joined up is policy making when it comes to trying to mitigate against the effects of climate change? And then on the other hand, looking at these uh, vector-borne diseases, is it joined up? Is it coordinated? Unfortunately, not enough. And I think there is not enough attention is being paid uh, to this particular area. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation about uh, what is actually driving climate change. Uh, some of it is a misinterpretation of the science. And uh, some of it, of course, is a lack of prioritization of this area. So there is need for a massive push and an appreciation that this is a major driver of poverty 
and that it is not just talking about uh, health and the well-being of uh, children who are the majority of the population on the continent and therefore the 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 one resource that we are relying on you know for demographic dividend but it is also about economic growth it's about productivity and it is our about our ability to, to sustain development so a lot of education still needs to occur on the african continent and ownership of the of the um of the mitigation agenda by policymakers. Thank you very much, Joy, and I'm sure we'll return to some of these themes shortly. Now, while we can talk about children, it's really important to hear from them as well. In fact, in many ways, young people are leading the conversation about the climate emergency, and it's critically important for us to listen to their concerns, ideas and hopes. One survey of young people in South Africa found that 90% of respondents viewed the threat of climate change as either very or extremely serious. So my next question is for Ms. Almaz Mudali, who I'm absolutely delighted to have with us today. She is an award-winning 13-year-old climate activist from South Africa. Almaz, it's fantastic to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. What is your perception of the threat represented by climate change and, and what inspired you to become a climate activist, activist and innovator? Thank you for the question, Alice, and thank you for the opportunity to share the stage with such esteemed panelists. In these times, being a climate activist is so rewarding because we're trying to solve the world's biggest problem. Contributing in my small way gives me immense satisfaction. I think whenever a person takes up a cause, as I've done with climate change, you automatically become an activist. But I see myself more as a climate change influencer because more people, big companies and governments have realized that we have to do something now. The hard job is influencing all these stakeholders to pull in the same direction without hidden agendas. And it sometimes feels like we're hurting cats. I enjoy contributing to policy in South Africa and I've had the great privilege of speaking to diplomats and ministers to try and influence the climate change agenda. But something I've come to terms with is that solving the climate crisis is complex. And that's why we must frame the agenda in a holistic manner, as outlined in the UNICEF WHO Lancet Commission report on children's health. We can't talk about climate change without talking about poverty alleviation, the environment, social injustice, and health, just to name a few. I often feel like governments don't provide regulations that are multilateral and don't inspire people to change. What we need is a movement. And that's largely the reason why I became a youth climate activist. We need a movement that organizes, organizes and mobilizes people from the grassroots levels up. For instance, when the Americans and Russians decided to put a man on the moon, it took a lot of planning, organizing, and even the development of a new science. And in the same way, climate change is going to take a similar approach. We can't rely on old ways of thinking and just old science. We have to invest in research and new science. We have to create a global culture change towards protecting and nurturing our planet, as the Americans did with the space program. So we have the experiences of having grand dreams and big ideas. What we need in this case is not to have one country's country, or for that matter, even a few countries do this. We need to do this as a species. Climate change is going to take many generations for us to solve. So it's an inevitable that youth will inherit these leadership positions. I know the youth of today has so many ideas. We are optimistic and have learned from past mistakes. If we just invest more in giving youth a voice, properly catering for their safety, health, mental well-being, as CAP 2030 aims to do, we are making an investment in our future. I hope I've answered your question, Alice. Almas, that's absolutely wonderful. I also wanted to ask you about your... Uh, your medal at the um, International Science Expo. W what did you do to win that medal? Well, what I noticed in my community was that there was big problems with food security. So I went and did a little bit of research and um, I found out that most of the problems was because food wasn't kept in the cold chain 
um, after it was bought from stores. So I set out to make um, an eco-friendly lunchbox that um, people in my community could make themselves at home. And it used very simple materials, but it was very effective. And um, I did a few experiments and um, food stayed um, fresh to eat in the lunchbox for up to a day. So um, I feel like that was my starting point into entering into all of these uh, climate change problems because it was uh, cheap and low cost and um, it didn't um, let any carbon emissions into the air. And um, I did this when I was 11. So um, it was really a great starting point for me. And um, I encourage any um, children that want to get involved in climate change to um, take it upon themselves to try and innovate and um, create solutions themselves and enter science expos. Amos, that's amazing. Thank you. I'm so impressed by um, your, uh, your grasp of uh, practical solutions, but also theoretical uh, uh, political challenges and, and potential solutions as well. And I want to pick up on one of your points, actually, that you raised and, um, and direct a question to um, the Right Honourable Helen Clark, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, who's here on the panel with us this morning. And we've got a question coming in for Helen from the audience, um, from Parents for Climate, Aotearoa, and uh, the question is, I'd love to hear what Helen Clark thinks as a former prime minister about how we can break down the barriers of, of political will. How can we break down those political barriers? Helen, over to you. Well, what I've seen in New Zealand the, the past the three and a half years is the government here uh, make quite a lot of effort to try to get the spectrum of political parties to come in behind at least the long-term target of, uh, of, of carbon zero. And that was achieved with, you know, I think the entire parliament, except for one member of parliament, uh, supporting legislation to that effect. But what's proving, of course, to be harder is getting agreement on the, on the specifics. Now, what I would say is that caring about climate change actually doesn't belong to any particular position in the ideological spectrum. This is an existential threat which should concern everyone, whether they're of a conservative or socialist or social democratic or green uh, disposition because of you know, the, the, the existential threat to all of us. Uh, so what I would really uh, recommend that is that in political movements uh, where, uh, for example, in my country, conservatives tend to be rather conservative on climate action. But I know of conservatives around the world who are proactive on climate action. We need them rallying to try to influence peers as well. I also think our, our youth and our children uh, can have very, very uh, big voices, uh, particularly at the local level on what they want their local government uh, to do. I, I think that the generation coming through is very motivated on this and they need to be heard. They need to bring new ideas and a sense of urgency to the debate, pretty much as, as Greta has done over these you know, past uh, three, four years or so. Thank you very much, Helen. And there's a, another question that's come in that's relevant actually with uh, uh, a question from Kids for a Better World uh, from UAE. And they ask, why is climate education not mandatory in our school curricula? How will children work to protect what they do not fully understand? Uh, does the panel think that there should be uh, more in terms of, uh, of education going on? Who would like to take that? I mean, maybe I can direct that to you first, Almaz. Do you, do you think that climate change should be more embedded in the curriculum than it is at the moment? I mean, obviously, you know, you are a climate activist, but do you think your peers are, um, are, are well informed about this area? You know, I think this is such an important question because education is something we talk about when we try to um, write climate action plans as the youth. And, um, you know, those that don't understand will just will be followers and they can't be leaders. And um, there is climate change in the education system. I know specifically in South Africa and in my school, but we need a more hands-on approach where we need to focus on implementation so that children can go um, to the oceans and um, try and clean it up or even start, um, you know, 
food gardens in their school. So that's something I would love to be doing instead of just writing climate action plans or um, just writing tests about climate change. I'd love to be going and cleaning up the oceans and seeing the problems in person and um, then trying to solve it, coming back to school and trying to solve it myself. Thank you, Elmar. I don't know if anybody's got anything else to add at this point. We'll probably come back to education as I can see some more questions coming in on that theme. Uh, now we're going to move around the globe uh, from South Africa to look at how children in indigenous communities around the Pacific are being affected by climate change. So I have a question now for Dr. Colin Takui Tonga, who is Associate Professor of Public Health at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Colin, how are indigenous people of the Pacific being affected? And what can we learn from them about preserving the environment that all our health depends on? Well, thank you. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I want to go back to um, the statement that uh, Professor Costello made at the beginning. Uh, climate crisis, the climate change is not something that's uh, in the future coming our way. Children and their families and the people of the small islands of the Pacific are, are, are quite uh, vocal in their concern that the effects of uh, the climate crisis are impacting on them now and, uh, and acutely so uh, through no fault of their own. They're, they think that the, the large countries and the, the main polluters are dragging their feet. And meanwhile, access to clean water for children and their families is getting harder by the day. In the normal course of, of things, getting clear access to clean water in the small islands of the Pacific is a hard job, uh, even without the press added pressures of the climate crisis. You see droughts happening on a regular basis in the small islands in the Pacific North. On food, 80% uh, of their protein source comes from the sea and the impact of the, of, uh, the coral bleaching on the food chain and, and the fish and seafood ultimately has a negative uh, impact and reduces the uh, 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 food sources for, for children uh, and their families in the small islands. Uh, Joy spoke about dengue. In the, in the old days, dengue occurred, uh, dengue outbreaks uh, occurred every three or four years as, as virgin populations come through. But these days, dengue in pretty much all of the small islands of the Pacific is constant and, and not, and it used to be you get one strain at a time, but this time you're seeing all four strains uh, sometimes circulating in the community and having severe, severe impact on children and their families. So I hope uh, in those few uh, examples I've given you added to, to the contribution from Professor Costello on the impact of the climate crisis on children and their families. What are they doing? A lot, uh, actually, because they've been acutely affected uh, by the effects of uh, the climate uh, crisis. There is already a lot of educational material in the school curriculum of many of the small islands uh, in the Pacific. And in fact, in many small islands, there are uh, books, uh, children's books, uh, there are songs, there's poetry, there's uh, competition uh, uh, on uh, various issues to try and create awareness, increase awareness about the impacts of the climate uh, crisis. But one uh, uh, effective and popular traditional measure is um, uh, really imposing no-take uh, arrangements uh, in the reefs uh, and coastal areas of small islands where the community decides and everyone abides by the decision not to take uh, seafood for a period of uh, six to 12 months to allow the reefs uh, to generate. As you can imagine, uh, as I said, they're, they're heavily reliant on fish and seafood. So these are measures that the communities have put in place in addition to formal adaptation and mitigation measures that the government might have in place to try and uh, uh, mitigate against the effects of the, the climate crisis. 
uh, it's a phenomenon that's uh, common around the Pacific. Even here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Indigenous Māori use the rahui as a very effective uh, traditional measure of uh, conservation. Uh, no, not taking uh, seafood and, and, uh, and so on uh, to allow the reefs uh, to recover. So uh, the climate, the impact of the climate crisis on indigenous communities in the Pacific Ocean uh, is, is uh, pretty much everyone is aware and there's a lot of action already happening and governments and political leaders are very vocal uh, at the global level in terms of the negative impacts of the climate crisis on the small islands in our part of the world. Thank you very much for that, Colin. I mean, it sounds like that. That sounds like that. There, there are solutions emerging at a at a community level that are being uh, well supported by by governments. Do you, what could you? What do you think could be done better then? Oh, I think generally traditional measures, measures uh, developed, adopted, and agreed by the communities are better adhered to and better. Uh, than general uh, local government or official uh, interventions. Uh, people respect the decisions of their own communities and would comply with not taking seafood uh, as opposed to perhaps a measure that might be introduced by a government department. But nonetheless, I mean, these measures uh, work well together. And I think increasingly there's a recognition that there's uh, traditional methods traditional awareness and knowledge uh, have an important place uh, in the overall approach to uh, mitigating the effects of the climate crisis. Thank you very much, Colin. It's that, it's that old meme, isn't it? At local solutions to global problems. It's incredibly important. Uh, now, I know Anthony is very, very keen to ask Helen a question, and you may at this point in time, Anthony, come in with a question. Yeah, Helen, I you know, in our report that, that led up to this whole children in all policies that was published last year, we talked a lot about commercial exploitation of children. And we know that, uh, you know, we're going to cover that in another one of these webinars. But actually, the biggest commercial exploitation of children is fossil fuels. And that's the root cause or one of the root causes of, of the climate crisis. And clearly, you know, over the past 20 years, we should have been removing fossil fuel subsidies and most important, introducing carbon taxes and shifting taxation from good things like income to bad things like carbon. And various schemes have been put forward, but they haven't, haven't taken off. And we need to resist the lobbying of these very powerful interests. But politicians are in the firing line. How do you do you? What's the reason that we haven't been able to introduce carbon taxes and remove subsidies? And are you optimistic about our ability to do that in the next five or 10 years? I'm a bit more optimistic about the uh, removal of subsidies because uh, in the time of Christine Lagarde at the IMF, they really came on board thundering about this, about uh, really the complete <laughs> counterproductive uh, use and, and waste of money that goes into fossil fuel subsidies. If you took the fossil fuel subsidies and, uh, and plowed them into affordable, accessible, sustainable energy for all, think what you could do to, to aid the, the energy transition. So I think there is some momentum about removing subsidies, but I suppose what it points us to is the importance of a just transition, because, you know, it, as was often impressed on me at UNDP, if you don't have energy, you want it, and you may not be so exercised by where it comes from. So it's, it's up to policymakers, it's up to you know, the supportive environment that can be uh, created with the help of uh, all the different development actors from the international and regional development banks to the bilateral donors, the philanthropic foundations to budget governments being prepared to have policy settings that are conducive to sustainable energy to get the investment public and private if necessary into that uh, because if if you know the what's facing someone living on the margins of society is higher diesel price and no other option well you're going to get a reaction i remember a number of years ago without warning uh, Nigeria announced that it was removing uh, 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 
subsidies on, uh, on I think, diesel or petrol, whatever. People went berserk, you know, they had to back off. <laughs> so you, you can't go cold turkey. I, I think, you know, for an example of how to do it, uh, look at what Spain did uh, with the, the closure of its coal mines, which it did at relatively short notice, but it did it with a huge regional development package where the people affected were. You know, as Germany looks to how it phases out of coal production in the rural valley and so on, it needs a just transition. It needs to provide other alternatives. So I think, you know, in all of this, keep that term just transition in mind. We need the energy transition, but we have to ensure that it's just and doesn't further marginalise the poorest. Thank you very much, Helen, and for that question, Anthony. And as I mentioned right at the beginning, CAP 2030 has grown as a response to the recommendations of the World Health Organization Lancet UNICEF Commission, bringing together 40 child health experts around the world, which published its landmark report last year. And we have with us Tamara Lucas, who is executive editor at The Lancet. Tamara, can you sum up what the report says and particularly focusing on climate change? And where do we stand since the report was published a year ago? Thank you, Alice. Yes, of course. So the Commission really laid the foundations for starting a new global movement for child health that would address this climate emergency while also positioning children at the centre of sustainable development goals. So the recommendations really were threefold. Um, and I think they also reflect the, the answers that Helen's just given as well um, as other panellists. So the first is a high level call for governments to work across sectors. The second is that the Commission really drew attention to severe threats of climate and also advertising and commercial pressures. And then the third was about mobilising communities and families and most importantly, supporting young people's movements. So all recommendations were designed to ensure that children would receive their rights and entitlements now and also to have a livable planet in years to come. So, so in detail, apart from the ecological damage unleashed, um, through the climate emergency. It also called for children to have a bigger voice in the shape of the future. Decisions, instead of being taken on their behalf by all of these adults, voices like our Mars, um, and it's a privilege to be on a panel with her. So in the past year since then, um, COVID, as we've heard, has piled further disaster and suffering upon children through climate and other forces. And ultimately the commission provided the tools for action. So it wasn't intended to sit on a bookshelf as a weighty tome but it acknowledges the scale that's also been explained by Joy and Colin. Um, finally, it said that the effort required is enormous, but if we cannot deliver for our children, what is the measure of our civilization? Thank you very much, Tamara. And it's certainly not sitting on a bookshelf as, as we can see this morning. Um, thank you to all the panelists we've heard from so far. There will be more discussion after we've seen the film because you know, at this point I could read out the 50 page commission report to you or we could watch an elegant summary of it in video form. And I think I know which you'd prefer. So I think we'll go for that video and then we'll be back for more discussion focusing perhaps a little bit more on solutions to these potential challenges and threats and we'll be looking at how we can address in particular the child health crisis. So we'll see you in 16 minutes time after the film. You see people around the world who are suffering. It's just getting worse and worse every day. Whenever I see adverts for alcohol, I feel disgusting. There'll be no resources for human beings to use. We need to be protected. Today's children face an uncertain future. The climate emergency, conflict and migration, pervasive inequalities and predatory commercial practices threaten the health and future of children everywhere. With COVID-19 and a global economic downturn only adding to these issues. What we see in the newspapers, in the epidemiological reports, are the consequence of the major threat and the major pandemic that is affecting our world. This pandemic is called inequity, it is called social injustice and social exclusion. No country is providing the conditions needed for children to flourish. Strong leadership is needed across communities, governments and countries, as is listening to children and involving them in the decision-making process. 
it's the children who are going to say, but this is what I need, this is what we want, and this is what the future of humanity needs. It's a 1.8 billion constituency. It's their future. 1.8 billion people and their parents. That's a lot of votes. With bold action, we can and will make sure children have a future. We really need brave politicians. This is a big transition. It's not easy, it's difficult. And we need voters who will vote for politicians who care and who listen to the science and the evidence. In this film, we present the key findings of the seminal WHO UNICEF Lancet Report, a future for the world's children to help governments, communities, and industry make real change for the world's children. Let's start with the issue of our time, climate change. I am here to say our house is on fire. We are facing a disaster of unspoken sufferings for enormous amounts of people. And on climate change, we have to acknowledge that we have failed children will experience the worst consequences of climate change. I think climate change is one of the most important, most overlooked problems out there. We need to be protected from the global warming because it's no fair for the future because the adults are ruining it. A lot of people pollute, especially in the seas. They don't like to clean the environment. They cut off too much trees. I mean, when we watch the news, Sometimes it will show like all the ice melting. It makes me feel sad and worried that other kids who are younger than me, they won't get a chance to have a perfect childhood. This is the air we breathe. We should take care of it. Rising sea levels, extreme weather events, heat waves, drought, malnutrition, and the proliferation of diseases all take an inordinate toll on the lives of children globally. Why are we subsidising oil, diesel and gas to the tune of $5 trillion a year when renewables are more economic and cheaper now? Why are 90% of our children breathing unsafe air as a result? When climate emergencies strike, children suffer the most. If global warming exceeds 4 degrees Celsius by the year 2100, in line with the current projections, this will lead to devastating consequences for children and the whole planet. Si la Terre devient inhabitable, l'humanité n'aura aucune possibilité d'émigrer vers une autre planète. Il n'y a pas de plan B. Nous devons préserver notre Terre. Once we go above 1.5 degrees, we're in deep deep trouble. Right now we can make choices and we can change it in the way we want. So start now, change the world for the better. Don't look for hope. Look for action. Children are seeing tens of thousands of adverts a year on billboards and TV, at sports matches and on their phones. Why are our children in many emerging economies able to identify one or two cigarette brands at the age of five or six? Why do children in the United States and elsewhere see four to five alcohol ads per day? Companies are making huge profits by selling children a lifetime of ill health. With weak governments, weak regulations, we know very clearly that it's the food industry which is so powerful, it's the new tobacco today. We know that. Companies target children using powerful algorithms and social media kid influencers to promote unhealthy products. Not only are companies selling harmful products to children and their families, they're also harvesting their data to better target them for increased sales and profits. Children are being left to fend for themselves. 
Ha sido lo más fácil. Más de comida rápida en la tele. No sé ver saludable y pues, en realidad no es saludable. Mi abuelo fue un santo en los grupos loca. Cuando se hace usted de todo muy más. No es una buena influencia para los niños. Que se supone que, o sea, no deben de mentir a las personas. I don't think it should be allowed. Some countries are already taking action to protect children. From Norway, we have good experiences with limiting marketing of harmful products in general and to children especially. Hemos logrado que la regulación del etiquetado de alimentos y bebidas no alcohólicas, la publicidad de alimentos dirigidas al público infantil y medidas fiscales para limitar el consumo de bebidas azucaradas ahora sean una realidad en nuestro país. In addition to national legislation, we need international action on top of greater respect for existing rights and laws to protect children. The Commission recommends adding a legally binding optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. This would require governments to prohibit or regulate products that should not be marketed to or for children. Many of these issues are cross-border. They don't stop at borders and this needs a global approach. Childhood is a window of opportunity to make huge improvements in a person's life. Evidence shows that a healthy childhood improves physical and cognitive capacities with benefits throughout the person's entire life. Investing in the health and well-being of children and adolescents even brings lasting benefits across generations and for the whole of society. Healthy, cared-for children with good educations grow into adults who are better equipped to raise their own children and contribute to society for the greater good. And it's cost-effective. Intervening early also costs less than compensating with corrective interventions at later ages. The cost of inaction for not providing universal preschool home visits to follow child development and improve nutrition is substantial and could reach more than 10% of a country's GDP. The evidence is clear. The ethical, practical and economic case for investing in health and development of children and adolescents is irrefutable and it's the right thing to do. Not one single country is currently providing all the conditions needed for every child to grow up and have a healthy future. But some countries are doing better than others. In 2015, the world united to agree on sustainable development goals to reduce poverty, improve health and protect the environment. Yet five years later, few countries have recorded much progress. Children's rights are not being delivered. Sustainability is about every single human being on our planet, not just some people in some places. The report, A Future for the World's Children, ranked 180 countries on two dimensions. Flourishing, how children in the country are doing today in terms of health, education, development and safety. In short, children's ability to lead happy, healthy lives. And sustainability, whether countries are reducing CO2 emissions to provide all the world's children with a healthy future on this planet. Although many high-income countries rank well in child flourishing, they are near the bottom when it comes to sustainability. The reverse is true for lower-income countries. This is about a shared future. Lots for high-income countries to do. Look at your contribution to carbon emissions. That, that really changes which countries are ahead and below. All countries must do better to look after children's health and well-being now and in the future. It's not only the children in the developing world, but also the children in the rich world who are today facing such an uncertain future. Governments, civil society, communities and young people around the world are all needed in the movement to ensure that children are at the centre of all sustainable development policies. 
All sectors are responsible for children's health and well-being. Housing, transport, schools are these safe environments for young girls and boys. Protection of children's health in the home, immediate environs and the wider urban or rural area must involve all sectors such as industry, transport, environment and justice. We speak a lot about multi-sectoral action but we also have to support countries in developing the competencies to work multi-sectorally. How people learn to negotiate and advocate and really make partnerships across various sectors. For national governments, child well-being is rarely an explicit concern for top political leaders and usually is handled by specific departments that often lack the political leverage required. This needs to change. Countries need executive pressure to bring sectors together. These synergies will make the required catalytic change. Responsibility for child health and well-being goes beyond the health and education sectors. All sectors are responsible for making a better world for children and must work together on this basis as equal partners. El mismo tema, o sea, en que en 50 o 100 años yo ya tenga como supongamos 45 años o ya sea una adulta y tenga hijos y esos hijos pues no les dé como oportunidad de vivir. Rent, bills, everything, all of that. You can stay jobless or losing someone. Not knowing if I'm going to be able to make it out there. There is enough evidence that we cannot eradicate violence with more violence. Children cry out of the world without violence in their homes, in schools, health services, in neighborhoods across borders between countries. A global movement for children can't take place without children. Children's voices must be heard as key participants in the decision-making process on policies affecting their health and well-being. If we truly value children, we must pass the mic and listen hard. Nothing for us without us. The landmark convention on the rights of the child stipulates children's rights to be involved in decisions and actions that affect them, to be able to express their views and to have these duly recognised by adults. There is also growing recognition that promoting meaningful participation of children contributes to social cohesion, more equal communities and helps adolescents make a better informed and more empowered transition into adulthood children have meaningful contributions to make. It's up to adults to make time to listen. The world is at a historic turning point. Children could have a future of great opportunity, but stand on the precipice of a crisis, which undermines this very future's foundations. I would like to live in a world that people would actually make things that are recyclable and not just like straight going into landfill. I want to grow up in a healthy environment where there is no shooting or killing. In a good world where everyone respects each other and not judge each other about their race. In a world filled with peace and happiness. The task ahead will be great, but we have the power to correct course and we must do it now. We need to bring together governments, civil society, communities and children to form a global movement to ensure children are at the heart of sustainable development. We all should ask ourselves in everything we do, are we making the world better for children? As we rebuild a post-COVID world, let's make sure it's better, healthier, cleaner and more equal. Let's listen to the experts, the science and take action before it's too late. Let's vote for leaders who care. Let's create a future we can all look forward to, generation upon generation. Not only do children represent our hope for the future, they also deserve the best world we can provide them. Only by working together with children at the centre of our political, economic and social action can we make the world that's worthy of them. There are no excuses and no time to lose. I cannot think of any more important human face than the face of a child who's going to inherit this world. Well, I think everybody watching will agree that that was an extremely powerful film. Those children that we saw in the film are calling on us to take action. 
Now, in the film, we heard from Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Jacques Dubochet, and I'm delighted that Jacques is with us this morning. And I'd like you to uh, respond to that film, Jacques, and also tell us why you became a climate activist. Yes. Hey. Are you? We can hear you. Okay. Yes. Well, there is nothing more important than the face of a happy child. We have seen a number of those during the last hour. I'm probably in the audience and all from all the people we have seen during this hour, one of the old, not the oldest, but quite old. We have seen a number of people of middle age. Those we have seen on the screen are probably those who are working hard to change the situation, but we have seen a large number of children and those those are those who are bringing us in toward a real solution for the moment temperature is increasing exponentially and since say rio rio conference 30 years ago a lot of country has decided to hack to fight that again but the curve is not flattened by the smallest part. Nothing has been reached until now. So, children, they are, these are those who are going to bring us to a solution. We, the oldest, we, those who are active in the society, those who are directing the society, we must respond to the young people and to their need and act much more because we have not yet started to act. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacques. And we are going to move on now to focus on potential solutions. As Tamara Lucas, executive editor at The Lancet explained before we saw the film, the WHO UNICEF Lancet Commission wasn't just about identifying the scale of this challenge, but about motivating us to work on solutions. And that is what this brand new initiative, Children in All Policies 2030, is all about. And starting with supporting nationally driven work in nine countries. So it's time for me now to introduce CAP 2030's Executive Director, Dr. Sarah Dalgleish. Sarah, please could you tell us about some of the work that CAP2030 is already involved with? Sure. Thank you so much, Alice. Uh, Children in All Policies 2030, uh, CAP2030, is, as you said, an initiative to center children's health and well-being in all policies to ensure an equitable, sustainable future. Supported by the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, we have an incredible global network of collaborators who all believe in our mission of protecting children's health through science advocacy and coalition building. And you can see that on this uh, call, on this event today. So what exactly does CAP 2030 do to start to um, implement some of these policies? Well, we have three main goals. Our first goal is to support programs and countries to put children's issues in all policies. So this means bringing together stakeholders across sectors to coordinate action for children. This year, we're beginning work with partners in nine countries. So I'm just gonna share my screen so I can show you which countries those are. So uh, as you can see them here, we'll be working in Argentina, France, Ghana, India, Nepal, Pacific Island countries, Senegal, South Africa, and Sweden. Now this includes low, middle, and high income countries because no country is doing enough to protect children's health and their future in this, uh, their future on this planet. Work in these countries is going to vary quite a bit um, based on the challenges faced in each country. For example, in Nepal, children will use technology to identify climate related disaster risks in different ecological zones. In South Africa, CAP will work with uh, to protect children and families by looking at multi-sectoral alcohol policy reform. In France, we'll work with mental health experts on how to sensitively process the stress of the climate crisis 
with children and adolescents. So really a lot of exciting work all around the globe that we hope to expand in coming years. Our second goal is to boost children's voices and perspectives on the global climate emergency. So we want to amplify children's activism, the work of kids, adolescents, youths like Almaz today, because as we've seen, children are and youths are leading on this issue. And we want to support policymakers with data and evidence on the impacts of the climate crisis on children, as well as possible solutions. Our third and final goal is to fight commercial marketing and exploitation of children. As we saw in the film, children are the targets of sophisticated, well-financed marketing campaigns for things like alcohol, tobacco, sugar-sweetened beverages, ultra-processed foods, and even things like gambling apps on their phones. So we'll work with countries and civil society to amend international treaty law and support national legislation protecting children. So as you can tell, CAP has an ambitious agenda, but we can't achieve it without the participation of people all around the world, including we hope the people who are here watching today. So you can find out more at our website, cap2030.org and join us for future webinars to learn more. Thanks, Alice. Thank you very much for that uh, quick roundup of what CAP 2030 is, is doing now and uh, planning to do in the future. Now, some of those countries have chosen climate related projects and you can read more about those on the CAP 2030 website. Tomorrow is not only Earth Day, which is a major environmental grassroots movement involving billions of people, but a very important leaders summit for climate with more than 40 heads of state. The meeting aims to kickstart effective and hopefully urgent action. We need it to be urgent now, don't we, on climate change mitigation. The Right Honourable Helen Clark, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, is with us. Helen, you co-chaired the WHO UNICEF Lancet Commission and you've been leading investigations into the global response to COVID-19. What would your advice be to the Leaders' Summit in terms of the importance of thinking about the challenge from the perspective of children? Well, I, I have a few messages for the, the summit, and I've attended a lot of summits in my time. Uh, my, by definition, to me, policymaking is about the future, and our children are our future. I myself am, am not a parent or grandparent, but I am a great aunt to 14 small children aged from about six weeks to, to seven and a half. And I worry about their future for all of the reasons that have been revealed in the Lancet WHO uh, UNICEF uh, report. You know, the children growing up against the background of the syndemic of really quite devastating uh, issues. And we have an obligation to bequeath them a, a better future than the one on offer if we don't uh, act. So I, I've got about four messages uh, to the leaders who are going to be participating in the online uh, uh, summit. And my first thing message is keep at the forefront of your minds the sort of future you would want your own children and grandchildren and all the children of your country to have. If we are not in leadership and policies for that, then what is the point of holding the positions if we don't want to leave something better uh, for future generations? My next message to them would be, uh, as a climate-focused summit, is lift your level of ambition on what your country can achieve on the climate action agenda. We're being told now uh, by the UN uh, that global emissions need to be uh, reduced by 45% by 2030. Now, given the special and differential responsibility uh, which high-income countries have for the stock of carbon in the atmosphere, high-income countries will have to do more. Now, the UK, I understand, has made a pledge of 59% reduction by 2030, the EU of almost 50. What will the US uh, commit? Uh, will it make a major and serious commitments? The signs are that it will. We just, we don't have a figure at the moment. And that's so important because it encourages others. For example, it may then encourage China to commit to its emissions peaking rather earlier than it's currently committed to. It may encourage India to lift its ambition. And this matters because those two 
great countries with their populations together, close to two and a half billion people, a third of humanity, if they lift ambition, it has such enormous consequences for the whole uh, world. My third message would be, uh, make climate change ambition and action, something which can unite us as a global community rather than divide us. We know there are profound geopolitical differences between uh, a number of those who are gathering at that online summit. But there are areas where we have to put the politics aside and work together in what is a shared human uh, interest. You know, think back to the eradication of smallpox last uh, year, uh, the 40th anniversary of eradication uh, was celebrated. And then think back to where the world was 40 years before. It was at the height of the Cold War. Even at the height of the Cold War, people could come together and say, this is a threat to humanity. It must be eradicated. That's the spirit that we need to think now about the global public goods we share. Uh, obviously, averting pandemics is another one where we need a collaborative action. But the climate crisis needs everyone rowing in the same direction. Everyone has to be part of the solution. My last message would be to the leaders, listen to the children and young people in your countries, because actually so many of them get it. They have ideas, good ideas. They want leaders to act. They want to be included in the debate and in the implementation, because it's their future that we are talking about and they are talking about. And it's a future which shouldn't be dominated by these mega extreme climate events and the trauma that is associated with them. It shouldn't be a future with insecure food and water supply. These things are so impacted by the climate crisis. Uh, it shouldn't be a future with the heightened risks of heat stroke, dehydration, more exposure to the vector borne diseases and so on. And my final overriding message then would be think about all of those risks to the future of your own children and grandchildren and act for them now on the climate crisis. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, I hope that some of the people attending that summit will hear your advice and heed your advice. I'd like to ask you if you're optimistic, though, because you obviously have a, a very good understanding of how governments work and don't work together on global challenges like this. Are you, are you broadly optimistic that around the world we really will be able to transcend those geopolitical differences and work on this challenge together? Uh, I do have optimism because of the change of administration in the United States. And it, it is like night and day. Uh, and John Kerry's back. You know, he was, as Secretary of State, such an important you know, player in the negotiation and agreement of the uh, Paris Agreement. He's back as a special envoy. He's, he's doing uh, the rounds. You know, the, the Trump administration abandoned the agenda, pulled out of Paris, uh, and that gives everyone else an excuse not to do much, right? Well, America's back, and this just matters so much. And as I say, you know, let's try and create some healthy competition here. If America's back in lifting ambition, Will that lead Australia to lead ambition? Uh, will it lead Japan to lead ambition? You know, pretty important players. Uh, will China then say, well, actually, we could do more. India, we could do more. You know, let's hope one day we have leadership in Brazil, which will want to do more because what they can do is, is so vital to the, the climate system's uh, equilibrium. So, yeah, I, I am optimism and optimistic, and I do hope as I say, that this can be kind of a step back from the, the geopolitical is issues that divide and become one that unites. So that'll need you know, pretty sophisticated diplomacy. But as we've seen in Paris, with the incredible leadership of the French, by the way, I mean, the, the president, the, uh, the foreign minister, the, the ambassador who was the special envoy, no stone left unturned to make Paris succeed. And that's the spirit we need. That is wonderful to hear, Helen, and let's hope that we can continue in this direction of, of raising, lifting ambitions and, and, and raising not only aspirations, but, but real action as well. There's a question that's come in from uh, a viewer, Babs Amod, who says, 
we're looking 10 years ahead with with cap 2030 but often you know 40 years ahead but the urgency is now why not severely penalize countries that don't support this movement and are slow to react urgent implementation rather than more policies required um does anybody have a a perspective on that you know should be should we be looking to penalize countries that are that are not working on this challenge anthony well i'll let joy in a minute but um just to say i mean we you know there is no global government there is no global policeman and you know gunboat diplomacy hopefully is a thing of the past um one thing i would just wanted to say as a sort of solution point of view we often look to political leaders to be the only source of the solution but actually we all have a tiny bit of power in our hands the way we consume and you know for example I've led a very carbon intense life and I used to travel all the time to conferences overseas and all of this and we don't need to do that anymore with Zoom and we can ask ourselves questions. Are we going to consume from companies that are very bad on the uh, pollution front or from ones that are good? You know, recently I wanted to get a pair of trousers and my wife looked up all the different companies that you can look for their carbon uh, and their ch children's labor rights and things such as that. And I discovered to my surprise that a lot of the brands that I was using came from actually very poor companies. So I think the way we rate the private sector and the people we consume from. And there's a lot that we can also do for our local environment. Just, you know, uh, I've been up in, in a coastal village for much of the lockdown, and I've been amazed at how many local people go out and are litter pickers and pick up plastic and rubbish and pay attention to the local environment. And I think we can all contribute to that. So there's a lot that we can do as individuals, as well as putting pressure on politicians at the centre. Thank you so much. Um, and Joy, I think you wanted to come in at this point as well. Yes, I mean, I, I coming from the developing world, um, my feeling is that uh, imposing penalties uh, would probably not help. But they, there's a huge, um, uh, what can I say, tool that can be used, leverage that can be used we get a lot of our development assistance from the development banks, from international financial institutions. 60% of the resources that were invested in energy in Africa have been from our international resources. Now, if these international resources can, can only fund clean energy, there will be a huge revolution. I mean, you know, we have 920,000 children that we are losing every day because of indoor air pollution, because of pneumonia and other lung diseases caused by indoor pollution. Over half a billion Africans uh, are actually uh, don't have access to, to clean energy. They are using fossil fuels. And fossil fuels, uh, you know, being really wood and charcoal, not, not even, uh, you know, connected to any power grid. Now, there's a huge opportunity here for any additional investment, particularly coming from these international financing institutions, to go into clean energy that is going to address this half a billion, but that is also going to address the current uh, people who are, who, are, who are using fossil fuels. So I, I think uh, we just need to reshape our development ethos and make it clean development. And that alone, without any additional penalties, is going to change uh, things for, for the developing world. Thank you, Joy. And Almaz, I think you wanted to comment on this as well. Yes, um, so I want to say that whilst it's fantastic um, to have decisive action, some of these topics are complex and um, we can't have knee jerk um, reactions. I think we need to think through decisions. Um, for example, if we had to close down a fertilizer factory, um, this could have devastating impact on food security and unemployment, even though we know fertilizer is very bad for our soil. And um, sometimes I think the procrastinated decision is the better one. But nevertheless, um, 
climate change is an uncharted territory. So I think we need to give a message of hope and um, willingness to improve rather than to only criticize and um, yeah. Thank you very much, Almaz. I think you're completely right that we always need to look at problems holistically and think about all of the different impacts that any of our actions um, might create. And, and Anthony, thank you for reminding us about individual responsibilities too. There are so many layers to this, from, from individuals working to decarbonize their own lifestyles to governments who have crucial ways in facilitating us to do that and to help their populations meet the challenges facing us this century. And I'd like now to return to that even, even wider perspective of thinking about the global scale of this challenge as well and the way that we need to work together uh, internationally, uh, across borders, um, just as Helen Clark reminded us with her points to um, the Leaders' Summit. The UN, of course, is critical in tackling cross-border issues like climate change and protecting children the world over. So I'd like to introduce now Dr. Abu Bakar Campo, who is Director of the Health Section at UNICEF, and Dr. Anshu Banerjee, who is Director of Maternal, Newborn Child and Adolescent Health and Ageing at the World Health Organization. So I wonder if you could each tell us what UNICEF and the WHO are doing with respect to children and child health and the climate crisis. And Abu Bakar, if I could start with you, please. Uh, thanks, Alice. Um, as the report, uh, A Future for the World's Children, rightly highlighted, you know, the environmental, social, economic, and political conditions, um, and today as well, COVID-19, continue to threaten the health and the future of the children in every single country. I also wouldn't be surprised, you know, that in the near future, uh, while we haven't yet established the whole origin of COVID-19, that you know, deforestations, uh, global warming has contributed. You know that uh, some of the viruses are moving from uh, animals, you know, to different vectors and over to human. You know, and if that's the case, you know, we should be embracing ourselves. You know, for other pandemic, if we're not getting you know global warming and climate change under control. Um, in decades, you know, of progress on child survival, you know, in health and well-being is today at risk because of climate change and environmental degradation. The very, the very economic system that has helped deliver many gains for children over the past three decades, it's the same system who's now threatening their survivors, health and well-being, and it is driving climate change uh, as well causing pollution. Uh, and the poisoning places where children live, play, and go to school. 58% of the world's populations live today in urban areas uh, or will be living in urban areas by 2025. 93% of all children live in an environment with air pollution levels above WHO guidelines or standards. More than half a million deaths in children are linked to air pollution. This is more than HIV AIDS, malaria and measles combined. One in three children have unsafe level of lead in their blood, risking their intellectual development uh, to be impaired. Road traffic injuries are killing more than 600 children and adolescents each day. And the number of cars are expected to double in 20, by 2030. Environmental hazards have been linked to a range of significant health risks that has already been mentioned. And UNICEF is elevating action on climate change and environmental degradations for and with young people in its programs to strengthen primary care with a focus on prevention. Uh, UNICEF has launched a new global program framework, Healthy Environment for Healthy Children, that outlines how UNICEF will work with WHO, UNEP, and other UN agencies, governments, private sector, and civil society. This includes helping solarize health facilities, schools, reducing even the carbon footprint you know, from our own offices, building resilience at facility and community level, very important, strengthening primary healthcare, 
so that it is responsive to the environmental risks children face. Integrate, integrate environmental health in the education system to support school environments and climate change education. Promoting climate and environmental actions with children and mobilizing collection, collective actions and policies and legislations. Build government's capacities, data collections and monitoring by building partnerships. Every child has the right to a healthy and safe environment. Decisive actions is needed by states, businesses and civil society. Countries that support the future generation put a high priority on ensuring all children needs are met, including primary healthcare and healthy environment. In the eyes of UNICEF, any policies which does not have at, at its center the best interest of children is not a progressive policy at all. And I think that is the way how we need to look at it. And as Antonia said, you know, change starts with yourself. Uh, you cannot just put everything on policymakers. Everybody needs to be contributing to it. And you know, change starts with yourself. And uh, I will be calling everyone, you know, to start with yourself of getting into the movement, joining the voices of those young people and making it happen. Uh, I mean, we can be having those seminars uh, endlessly, but if you're not changing ourselves, there will be no movement and there will be no change. Thanks, Alice. Thank you, Abu Bakar. And I wonder if I could now come to you, Dr. Anshu Banerjee, for a perspective uh, from the World Health Organization. Thank you, Alice. And I would just like to focus on four points that WHO is uh, working on. First of all, it's about advocating for healthier environments for children. And as already mentioned, uh, we know that about 25% of all diseases in children under five could actually be prevented by improving the environment in which they grow up. And uh, in 2012, this was estimated to have led to around 1.7 million deaths in children under five. So just, you know, focusing on, on climate and on the environment can have a huge impact there. Um, WHO has therefore also worked with special rapporteurs and with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the child rights institutions to provide evidence and actions needed for the environment to be considered a child right. And uh, this resulted last year with the, UN High, uh, with the UN Human Rights Council adopting a historic resolution, I could say, underlining the need of states to take measures to protect the rights of children and future generations in the face of environmental harm, including by recognizing a right to a healthy environment in national uh, legislation and ensuring that the best interests of the child is a primary consideration in environmental decision making. So I think here we're starting to really look at how we can support legislation at country level and have legal tools to support this. Um, just as WH also, we want to uh, have a briefing session with the Interparliamentary Union <clears throat> to make them aware of the findings of the Lancet uh, WHO UNICEF Commission. And to come back to an earlier question in the session, um, we are coming up with standards on what a health promoting school would look like. And within the curriculum, we feel that it's important that uh, the school curricula foster understanding values and attitudes that support sustainable consumption and sustainable environments. So that was around advocating. Secondly, we're supporting countries with risk assessment and risk management. So um, WHO is supporting countries to conduct a climate change and vulnerability and adaptation assessment. And um, this is at the population health level. And so these assessments will then provide evidence on future health risks for climate change for those countries. And this will then align them to uh, allow them to design specific actions to aim to protect children's health from the impact of um, climate change. And this is then followed up by risk management. Um, and this is done by developing comprehensive plans in order to address those risks uh, while strengthening overall health systems resilience. The third point is about promoting climate resilient wash or water sanitation and hygiene services. And we know that sanitation systems 
will become more vulnerable to flooding from storms and sea level rise. Um, and so even small losses uh, will actually affect health of whole communities. And so governments must really think beyond conventional sewage systems. And we know that this is a, a long time process. And so it's, it's good that countries really uh, take this in mind on how they can uh, change resilience to water supply systems in relation to climate change risks. And finally, the fourth point is just around uh, capacity building in the health sector on children's environmental health. And so there are two packages that we have. We have a training package for healthcare professionals on global climate change and child health. And we also have a, a, a training package on children's environmental health uh, for the health sector. So that's around capacity building. Thank you very much. Angie, that's absolutely wonderful. Thank you. And um, you have actually answered one of the questions, I think, that's come in uh, from viewers this morning, which was about education and, and climate change and what barriers might be there and what we can do to, um, to remove those barriers and improve education. Uh, so, so that's brilliant. Thank you. I want to end with, or just as we're drawing to a close, I want to um, squeeze in maybe a couple of questions we've had a few questions that are focusing on very very similar themes one of which um, is about whether governments really are prioritizing public health adequately around the world and another is about the burden of disease versus the burden of responsibility and that's probably best encapsulated by this question from the children's institute at the university of cape town how do we hold industry accountable oil coal gas food especially as emissions are now spiking uh, in an effort to build back after COVID um, and there's vast money vested interests and power at play. There's clearly a need to resist um, some of the, the, the push here. How are governments going to be able to do that? Does anybody want to tackle that question? I'm looking around uh, the panel. Uh, Abu Bakar and then Joy, Abu Bakar. I think it goes back to your other questions, you know, how do we hold, you know, governments accountable to do more even for climate change, you know, uh, and global warming. And, and I think, you know, with, with, with the industry there, are, I mean, as we all know, there are some very powerful lobby. Um, and there's always a lot of money always involved in it uh, in this sense. But, you know, despite that, I think, Politicians are also, if the constituencies, the, the group of constituencies are quite loud enough and quite large enough, uh, you know, they also look at the electorate. Uh, so the, we just need to make sure that we have a big movement that social, civil society plays their role to basically enforce some of those legislation and hold those politicians accountable. Uh, it, 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 there's nothing in this world from our experience, you know, which comes just by goodwill. There will be always, you know, bad apples, you know, who are not playing by the rules because they are other vested interest in it. But I think the population, the civil society, you know, the, uh, the people can, if they are holding together and if the movement is quite strong, can hold them accountable and really make sure that, you know, legislation is enforced um, uh, and plays their role, uh, even with big industries, you know, who have very powerful lobbies. Thank you, Abu Bakar and Joy. You wanted to comment. I absolutely agree with Abu Bakar. This is one area where penalties and uh, uh, and, uh, and 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 action actually work. But I think we have learned like from the framework convention on tobacco control, that first of all, you do need the regulatory environment. It has to be there. And it is there with the framework convention because of the lobbying of the population. The people have to stand behind this and they have to push for the change. And once the, 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 the regulatory environment is there, enforcement, and this is where penalties work, where action, where, where you know, action against uh, against uh, uh, those members of the industry that do not want to promote the future of our planet, you know, ha has to work. So I do agree with Abu Bakr. It's the only way. It's difficult, but it, there is no other uh, option. 
Thank you very much, Joy. And I'm going to draw this launch event of CAP 2030 to a close now. I hope that you have found this discussion stimulating. Thank you to all of our panel today for sharing their expertise and giving us an insight into the work of CAP 2030 at this inaugural event. Thank you too to everybody who's contributed questions today. And thank you everyone watching, whether you're watching us live right now or catching up on YouTube. It's always good to go away with something to read, and I'd like to draw your attention to a commentary about CAP 2030, which is published in The Lancet today. And our sincere gratitude also goes to the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, which is supporting CAP 2030 and has made this event possible. We've touched on some of the most crucial and pressing issues of our time, the future of our children, of humanity itself, and our amazing planet, and I hope that you've found this launch event inspiring. We face enormous challenges, but we can work together. And as Joy said, we all need to push for change. I hope that every one of you will continue to question, to research, to teach, to transmit, to lead, to push for that change and to set an example, because that's how we'll ensure the conditions for the healthy, happy lives of children now and for future generations. Please stay involved with CAP 2030. We very much value your support, your advice and your engagement. Follow us on Twitter to stay in touch with our work, to hear about how the projects develop and upcoming events as well. This is just the beginning. Thank you, everybody. Until next time, keep well. <laughs>